interruption in this important public discussion. And please, no flash photography of any kind. Thanks for your cooperation, and let's save San Diego Opera. This town hall meeting on San Diego Opera, Moving Forward, Alternative Models for Opera in America. I'm Nick Rodellis, the Geisel Director of Education and Outreach for San Diego Opera. Our hosts are board members Carol Lazier and her husband James Merritt, and the Special Board Committee to Save San Diego Opera, and the White Knight Committee. <laughs> They should all be publicly thanked for their generous support, their treasure, and their time. <laughs> At this time of crisis for our company, we thought it'd be appropriate to take some time to listen, to reflect, not only with each other and to each other, but to experts in our field to try and focus on exactly what opera is in the United States today and what its future can hold for our community here in San Diego, our community of opera lovers and opera goers. You. A caveat, it is coincidence, pure and simple, that the San Diego Board of Directors, San Diego Opera Board of Directors happens to be meeting in La Jolla at the same time that we're meeting here. The scheduling of this event was firmed up before the last meeting of the board when it was determined that their next meeting would be at 2 o'clock this afternoon. It was not our intention for this to be a simultaneous event, and unfortunately it precluded the attendance of board members at this meeting, and for that we're very sorry. But as you can see, we're shooting this event for immediate release, at least tomorrow sometime, on YouTube, and eventual broadcast on UCSD TV. As well, it's being live streamed so that we can access a national and indeed an international audience. It is very possible then that a decision by the board concerning the future of this company will be reported while we're here at this meeting today. If there is breaking news, I'm sure you'll want to know about it as soon as it does break. Uh, so I promise that I'll announce any news coming out of the board meeting as soon as I can. I'm wired. And I know that the rest of you are too. <laughs> you can see them all going off at once. <laughs> yes, indeed. I'll leave it on, but it's on silent. Um, before we begin, let's get our definitions straight. The word or the phrase grand opera has been running around a lot. Grand opera isn't what San Diego Opera does. Grand Opera, to be very academic about it, is a specific 19th century French model of opera. The closest we've gotten to doing Grand Opera by definition are the two operas of Ferdi, Don Carlo and Aida. Both of these works were patterned on that French model. It is more appropriate to say that San Diego Opera does opera on a grand scale following the model given to all regional opera companies by the historical lead company in America, the Metropolitan Opera, whose productions were widely distributed since the 1930s through radio, recordings, and visits by opera lovers to the Metropolitan Opera House in New York. In a way, smaller regional opera companies like ours were mini-mets, offering their communities a taste of what New Yorkers experienced on a regular basis but bound by their local budget limitations. That model seems to be no longer relevant to many communities, and certainly to the San Diego community, it seems not to be relevant. It's especially difficult when we have to limit ourselves to a venue option that is a theater of 3,000 seats, a theater that physically demands that old model of opera production. With any change from this mini-net model, a new business model will be necessary, indeed imperative. And that's one of the reasons that we're here today, to find out what alternatives there are, what's been tried, 
and what works. But opera as a form of musical theater done in a high artistic style, be it grand or not so grand, can be much more broadly defined. Yes, it can encompass the classics of the Broadway stage, for instance, perhaps Gilbert and Sullivan as well, but can it not also include the earliest operas of the form, like operas of Monteverdi, Vivaldi, or Cavalli? And what about musical theater from other cultures and nationalities? Every culture in the world has an art form that tells great stories through musical and theatrical means. Our model happens to be based on the European tradition, but even within that European tradition, there are many different genres, styles, and forms of opera from its earliest days to the most recent artistic developments that remain unexplored by most regional companies, like ours. What about contemporary musical theater or opera that is written specifically for smaller theaters? And there is most certainly a place for opera written locally to respond to local issues. What about the issue of the international border between the U.S. and Mexico, something of which Cruzar la Cara de la Luna gave us in mariachi form just last season? Those are classic issues. What about uh, the issue of political corruption and power in our community? <laughs> wasn't meant to be a laugh <laughs> In fact, those are classic issues that every community has to deal with. Uh, even, even Verdi in 19th century Italy dealt wondrously with issues like political power and corruption in operas like Nabucco, Un Ballo in Mascara, and Simon Boccanegra. Why can't we be commissioning the contemporary Verdi's? I say all this as a prelude to our presentations and discussions because I want us, and I include myself, as a member of the San Diego audience, so you, to stretch our imaginations about what our company can be as we strive to formulate a successful new business plan, which, at least for you, the viewer, the audience member, is often about programming and not much else. We need to explore the depth and the breadth of opera literature as programming, and figure out what works for us, what attracts audiences, what attracts significant support, and what gives us an outlet for our passion for the art form. So without further ado, let me introduce our guest speakers. First of all, let me introduce David Devan, who was appointed as General Director of Opera Philadelphia in 2011. He joined that company in January 2006 as a Managing Director to oversee all of the income generating departments as well as for development and community programs. In 2009, he was appointed as executive director before assuming his current leadership role. Since his appointment, Mr. Devan has worked closely with his board on strategic planning initiatives and building partnerships within the community and the opera world. Key achievements include the establishment of the Aurora series for chamber opera, an extremely popular and highly subscribed opera series at the Kimmel Center's intimate 550 seat Perelman Theater. Let me repeat, 550 seat Perelman Theater. And the establishment of the nation's first ever collaborative composer in residence program with New York partners Gotham Chamber Opera and Music Theater Group, funded by a $1.4 million grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Under David's leadership, the opera has co commissioned three new works Dark Sisters by Nico Muley and Stephen Karam co-commissioned with Opera Philadelphia's co-composer and residence partners, Oscar, based on the life of Oscar Wilde and written by Theodore Morrison and John Cox, co-commissioned by Santa Fe Opera, and Cold Mountain, based on the best-selling novel by Charles Frazier and written by Jennifer Higdon and Jean Shear. Opera Philadelphia has also achieved a balanced financial position and received a major grant in 2011 from the Kresge Foundation to help fund institutional capitalization. That is David Devan. Our other guest is Mark Skorka, the president and CEO of Opera America, the support organization for the production of opera in the United States. Mark joined Opera America in 1990 as president and CEO, and since that time, the Opera America membership has grown from 120 opera companies to nearly 2,500 organizations and individuals. An additional 16,000 subscribers now receive free, a variety of free and fee-based services. 
Under his leadership, Opera America has administered two landmark funding initiatives in support of the development of North American operas and opera audiences, and launched an endowment effort to create a permanent fund dedicated to the supporting of new works and audience development activities. Opera America's relocation from Washington, D.C. to New York City, the first step in the construction of a national opera center, which opened in 2012, has increased communication and collaboration with and among members, both locally and nationally. Marcus led strategic planning retreats for opera companies, including ours, and other cultural institutions internationally, and has participated on panels for federal, state, and local funding. He's currently a member of the U.S. delegation to UNESCO, and serves as an officer of the Board of the Performing Arts Alliance and the Curtis Institute of Music. Meet Mark Squirrel. Mark will kick off our discussion with a description of the state of opera in 2014, the best of times, the worst of times, and give us some case studies of successful turnarounds from his point of view as head of opera America. Mark. <coughs> for organizing this wonderful town meeting, uh, for all of your interest in being here this afternoon, your care and concern about the future of San Diego Opera. I'd like to thank the media for their coverage of this, and I hope you keep it up even when there isn't controversy. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to thank all of my Opera America colleagues who've come together uh, here in San Diego, in Dallas for a meeting, the number of people who've offered their assistance to the company, to me personally. Uh, it's been a community response to try to help here in San Diego. I'd also like to thank all of the artists and administrators of San Diego Opera who for so many years have brought great performances to this community. <laughs> I'm going to chat with you a little bit about the challenges and the opportunities that are facing opera currently. We're going to talk about the state of the field, and I'm going to highlight some success stories of how opera companies have triumphed over the challenges that have faced them. One of the great examples is Opera Philadelphia, and normally when I make speeches like this, I talk a lot about David's work, so it's very nice to have David here, so I don't have to talk about his work, and we can do that. But first, you know, what, what are some of the challenges that every opera company is facing? And I would not be fair or honest if I didn't confirm that these are challenging times for opera companies. Uh, it has been uh, a very difficult 10 years, 12 years since 2000, 2001, and the recession of that uh, part of the decade. Then, of course, 2008, 9 made it more difficult. But there are a lot of other factors at hand that I'll talk about that have made the last 10 or 12 years particularly difficult for opera companies. We have, of course, the pressure of increased cost. Opera America tracks data of all of our members. We've done it for over 30 years. And looking at any standard group of companies producing the same amount of uh, productions and performances each year, we find that the cost of producing opera goes up at roughly two to two and a half times the cost of living. Two and a half to two and a half times the CPI is what we call the OPI, the Opera Price Index. <laughs> now, in opera, you can't achieve the efficiencies through technology that they achieve in industry. You can build a car now with four people running the computers that run a factory, but it still takes as many people to perform a very opera today as it did in the 19th century, probably even more. We have the cost pressure of hiring talented artists who are in demand around the world. We also have that internal pressure to be better next year than the, we were the year before. All of that costs money, and the cost of producing opera has risen steadily. There are other challenges. Audience attendance has decreased for tickets, main stage tickets, staged opera tickets in the opera house. Over the last 10 years, according to our data, the level one companies, which are our largest companies, and San Diego Opera is one of them, attendance, paid attendance at our largest companies has decreased by 
percent. This is a number that is reported by San Diego Opera. Some companies have decreased a little bit less, some a little bit more. The average of level one companies over the last 10 years is a decrease in paid attendance of 24 percent. Now, there are also changes in audience behaviors, resistance to subscription that used to be such a sustaining source of revenue. People who are buying tickets much later in the sales cycle, so opera companies have to spend more and more money on advertising to make sure people show up on Friday night or Sunday afternoon. And audience sensibilities that are becoming ever more sophisticated. People who do want to see Carmen again. People who hope never to see Carmen again. <laughs> people who love do opera, or operas that have conceptual approaches versus traditional approaches. The opera audience is not a monolith. And part of the art of running an opera company is to put together seasons that appeal to as many people as possible. Opera companies exist in a very, very competitive environment. We're competing for time. People work more. People are more connected all the time in the office and at home. People have so many other recreational and cultural opportunities within their communities. So we are competing for time. We are competing for the entertainment dollar. We're also competing for the philanthropic dollar. As more and more worthy organizations establish themselves and grow in the areas of healthcare, education, social services, and the environment, opera companies exist in an ever more competitive world. And it puts pressure on us to hire more staff, do more mailings and special events, again, pushing that cost ever higher. We also are existing in a diminished supportive infrastructure. There is less arts media coverage. And, uh, this notwithstanding all the cameras here today. It is more and more difficult to get reviews, to get feature stories in the newspapers. Newspapers are smaller and fewer people read them. There are fewer classical radio stations on which we can advertise or have interviews before opening night. There's a diminished recording industry. The recording industry used to be a real partner, <coughs> helping to produce stars and promote them with their posters in record stores or CD stores that don't exist anymore. There is decreased arts education in the schools so that children and their families aren't introduced to opera as readily as they used to be. There is diminished coverage or diminished integration of the arts into the popular culture when we think back to the way the three tenors crossed over into the world of the, of, of, of the popular world. Uh, Beverly Sills hosting the Johnny Carson show. Go back further to the Ed Sullivan show where I first discovered opera. So there are so many ways in which the support system around opera companies has become more fragile, contributing to the fragility of opera companies themselves. There have also been societal changes. Um, I clip articles back in at my office about some of these factors. The uh, tremendous increase in student loans and the impact on young professionals you wish to have in your audience. They're paying student loans. They're paying more money for housing and other essential services. There's the uncertainty of the economy and lingering unemployment at very, very high levels. The middle class is a worried middle class these days. And if you follow articles about the retail industry, we learn that, well, the high-end stores seem to be doing well, and the very low-end stores are doing well. It's those middle ground department stores that have been struggling for years, you know, the Macy's and the Sears and others like that. A lot of that's our audience. They're worried about the economy. They're worried about their jobs. We have a challenge uh, communicating our civic value across uh, the community. And we also have to admit that with demographic changes, our links as a country to our European cultural roots becoming more distant. So opera companies are facing real challenges. And I don't want to minimize those because then the hard work that our opera companies are doing, like Opera Philadelphia, wouldn't be grounded in, in the reality. But despite all of these challenges, there are intrinsic advantages. It's the good news about opera. The fact that we are a multimedia art form in a multimedia world. People are accustomed now to listening, looking, reading all at the same time. And that's opera. It's images, sounds, and words all at the same time. We have a, a rich American repertoire now that demonstrates that opera can tell American stories, contemporary stories, in operatic terms. Companies are increasingly discovering ways to have impact inside the opera house 
and outside the Opera House, in the community, not only in schools, but in parks and stadiums and other venues around town. Opera companies do offer, where they're invited to, wonderful education programs. Opera is an incredible portal into learning about history and literature, the arts, theater, music. It's a wonderful educational portal. Opera also still has the sizzle, the excitement of a special event. Even here, a few years ago you were doing five productions a year. It's not many. Now you're only doing four. Each one a special event. The rarity of opera increases the interest and curiosity about it. And we have as a fuel for opera the passion of the opera audience. There is no art form that is as sustained by um, knowledgeable enthusiasts as opera. It's a great asset for us. So there are challenges. There are intrinsic assets that we have. In terms of creativity, there are three dimensions by which I look at the state of the field. One is creativity, one is the audience appetite for opera, and the third is the condition of our opera companies. In terms of creativity, opera is in the best shape it has ever been in in the United States. We have more young artists, singers, directors, designers, composers, and librettists coming out of conservatories and universities than ever before. Thousands of young artists want to express themselves. <laughs> Many of these artists are hungry to perform or creating their own opera companies. We see it all over the country. In New York, we have the New York Opera Alliance that has over 30 smaller opera companies and ensembles. There are more than 20 in Northern California, a dozen in the Boston area, uh, a handful in the Washington, D.C. area, and in Chicago, where artists who want to perform using all of these social media that you, uh, that you know about are finding an audience, finding donors to support their work that takes place in church basements and lofts, in clubs. They do old works and new works or traditional works in a completely unusual way. Uh, these people are defining a 21st century American opera that isn't just opera on a grand scale or a grand opera, but opera of an inventive scale, opera of an inventive nature. Uh, more new works, as I said, are being commissioned and performed than ever before. Some of them by our traditional new works originators like Houston Grand Opera, San Francisco Opera, Santa Fe Opera, or the Opera Theater of St. Louis. But there are a lot of companies that are new to the realm of new works, like Florentine Opera in Milwaukee, Virginia Opera, Arizona Opera, National Opera, Fort Worth Opera, Opera Philadelphia. There are more new works producers than ever before, companies dedicated to creating new works. American Lyric Theater, American Opera Projects, Music Theater Group, Beth Morrison Productions, Here Performing Arts Center, and many, many more. There are a number of wonderful specialty companies, I call them, companies like Gotham Chamber Opera that perform smaller scale works frequently in different venues around the city of New York. Opera Lafayette in Washington, D.C. that only performs French Baroque opera. Urban Arias, a small company outside of Washington, D.C. that only performs operas that are newer than 40 years and shorter than 90 minutes. It's true. Opera is that very. We see a lot of our opera companies now that are doing classics from the American musical literature, like Lyric Opera of Chicago, the San Francisco Opera, Washington National Opera, to name just a few. And I know this year that uh, Lyric Opera of Chicago is doing four weeks of performances in their opera house, The Sound of Music, last year in their annual report between their musical and their new partnership with, uh, with uh, Second City Comedy Troupe. Second City Comedy Troupe does sort of cabaret evenings on the stage of the opera house where the subject matter around which they joke is opera itself. 25,000 new people in the opera house last season. Wow. I know that our opera companies have reached hundreds of new ticket buyers using Groupon, Living Social, and other social media. For Virginia Opera, it was hundreds of tickets to Butterfly. But for Dallas Opera, it was hundreds of tickets to Ana Bolena. Here in San Diego, Murder in the Cathedral. There are lots of people who are still very curious about opera and at the right price are prepared to come to the opera house. A number of our opera companies are experimenting with HD transmissions to the local sports stadiums. Dallas Opera now transmitting to Cowboy Stadium, Washington National <laughs> Opera to uh, National Park. 
at the Opera of Philadelphia to Independence Mall. David will tell you a little bit about that. The San Francisco Opera to AT&T Park, the baseball stadium. When the San Francisco Opera transmits to the baseball park, they get each year between 25 and 30,000 people who come to this wonderful event and using certain strategies, they attract between 5 and 10,000, they capture between 5 and 10,000 new email addresses of people who are interested in opera but haven't yet been to the opera house. And that's a free event. It's a free event, absolutely. Uh, the same at Cowboy Stadium and Independence Mall. They're all free events, uh, and people get to come. And it's a, a, a way of, of changing the narrative about opera, that opera doesn't just take place in the opera house in black tie, but opera can take place in other ways. Using electronic media can become a civic event that is free and friendly to all. Um, we have any number now of universities and conservatories that have paying audiences for what they're doing on campus. When the Metropolitan Opera has $20 and $25, $25 tickets, the line goes out of the door on some evenings. And certainly, what wonderful evidence of the interest in opera that 3 million tickets were sold last year to the Met HD transmissions. There is an audience for opera. It may not be an audience always for the grand opera experience in the opera house, but there are lots of audiences and ways that companies can reach audiences, uh, and David will tell you more about that. Our festivals are relatively healthy, because what we have found is that audiences are interested in more than just the opera performance, but in an expanded experience. So our festivals where people go away for a weekend, take a trip, and go see three and four operas while they're also going to museums or art galleries or having wonderful dinners, these larger experiences are sustaining the festival companies in Santa Fe, St. Louis, Des Moines, Central City, Colorado, and the Glimmerglass Festival in Cooperstown, New York. And I would note that in St. Louis, Des Moines, Central City, and Glimmerglass, none of those theaters is more than 1,000 seats. <laughs> Intimate opera can have more of an impact than even the grandest grand opera. A number of our opera companies are experimenting with site-specific opera, where they choose the venue depending on the nature of the work. Gotham Chamber Opera does that. When they did Rappuccini's Daughter, they did it in the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. They just did a wonderful uh, Baroque opera uh, that depicts a, uh, a fight among medieval warriors. They did it in the Arbor Gallery of the Metropolitan Museum. <laughs> just go up the road to Long Beach Opera and uh, some of the performances that they do. Or Boston's Opera Annex. When Boston Lyric Opera cut back from four productions to three, they finally were able to restore a fourth production. But instead of doing a fourth production in the Opera House, they started what's called the Opera Annex, where one opera a year is in a venue, whether it was the, they did one, the Lighthouse in the rotunda of the Kennedy Library. They did the Turn of the Screw, and more recently, Lizzie Borden in the Armory downtown. Um, so they expanded back to four productions, but the fourth production is in a found space. There's a company in New York now called On Site Opera. And of course, there's the industry, a new opera company in Los Angeles that's also doing sort of on site art installations. Some of our companies have actually branded these subsidiary kind of producing divisions uh, HGO, uh, Houston Grand Opera, HGO Co., LA Opera Off Grand, Lyric Unlimited are the names of some of these programs that consolidate this kind of wonderful activity. But as I say, the audience for our main stage productions has diminished, and for level one companies it's diminished quite significantly. Box office income as a percentage of overall income has continued to shrink. It's now barely over 30% of what a company needs to put on its entire <laughs> season, down from 40% 10 years ago and 50% 25 years ago. This places tremendous pressure on philanthropy. Corporate contributions are fairly flat, Foundation gifts are fairly flat as well. Government support is down slightly. Now, it's never been a big part of the picture, but it is down. The increasing reliance for every opera company is on individual gifts, on donors, small and large, who believe in the opera enterprise. And in some cities, they are being wonderfully successful in attracting new, donor, new donors and, and continuing the support of traditional donors. Now, with all of this difficulty, we have lost opera companies. Connecticut Opera in Hartford closed, and we have 
uh, no, no indication of a new opera company to replace it. The same is the case at Opera Pacific. In Orlando, the failure of that opera company has been sort of compensated for at Orlando Symphony's doing a number of semi-stage, concert-staged operas. In Baltimore, the company closed, but the new company, Lyric Opera Baltimore, has sprung up and is doing well. Of course, he lost Lyric Opera San Diego here several years ago. Some companies are on hiatus. They've chosen to just stop for a while, regroup, re-strategize, and think about how they can go forward. Cleveland Opera, Indianapolis Opera are a couple of those. But a number of opera companies have really triumphed over these challenges. And I think our message today is that despite difficulty, there are themes you'll find in our presentations that suggest there is a way forward. Some of the themes. Boards that are focused on the opera company's future, not the past. In workshops, I talk about opera companies. <laughs> of the past, you'll spend all your time trying to cut costs. If you are bored of the future, you're going to spend your time to do creative reinvention of what an opera company can be in the 21st century. <laughs> have a strong staff and strong board leadership that work well in partnership. They do thorough financial analysis and analysis of current programs and future possibilities. They are strong and steady communicators to all the stakeholders. They are bold, sometimes making high-risk decisions. They also generally invest heavily in organizational partnerships and cooperation with all stakeholders. It includes staff and unions, venues, and vendors. So I have a few examples. Um, my first example would have been Opera Philadelphia. I also talk a lot about Dallas Opera because in the case of the San Diego Opera, Dallas Opera is most analogous in terms of a budget size and difficulties that it, it had over the last decade. Uh, Dallas Opera went through a decade of leadership transition. They accumulated big deficits. They maxed out their lines of credit and had virtually no cash on hand when the new general director started. But he was a, a brilliant uh, analyzer of the situation, a wonderful commun communicator. He had and built a strong board. They cut back to three productions from five productions in order to reduce costs in the short term while they mounted several campaigns to raise cash for immediate payables, to reduce the deficit, to establish a working cash reserve. In the same season that they cut back to three productions, they launched a, an HD transmission to Cowboy Stadium. And just to digress one second, when using a certain technology that we've introduced into the field, if they map the area where their subscribers and single ticket buyers live, it's one side of the Metroplex. When they map the residences of the 15 to 20,000 people who attend Cowboy Stadium, they live in a different part of the Metroplex. The, the new map changes the narrative about Dallas Opera in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. They returned this year to four productions, one of which they did in a uh, live simulcast to nine locations around the world. And next year, they're going back to five productions, including a world premiere. Dallas Opera turned the corner. They had a big deficit to reduce. They had no cash, mounted several special campaigns. But at Fort Worth Opera, they decided to condense their operation and to become a festival. Because the Dallas Opera performed once a month through the winter, spring. You know what that's like. And Fort Worth Opera thought to do the same was silly. So they created contrast within their community by becoming a festival that attracts media attention and travelers from out of town. Austin Lyric Opera facing great financial difficulty. Again, huge cash shortage. They owned a building, and they sold it. They brought in an outside consultant. The board made the difficult decision to sell the office rehearsal center that they built. And it was an award-winning building. They sold it, paid off the deficit, have new leadership, and the company is going forward very, very well. Palm Beach Opera, again, excellent staff board partnership. You would think that it would be easy to fundraise in Palm Beach, but it's not. They were facing the same difficulties. They had several, several special campaigns to raise cash to pay tomorrow's payroll. But they reduced to three productions. They reduced the number of performances. They introduced community performances around 
in different venues around the city. They introduced a park concert, which now performs right down by the water, and they'll have a new uh, app where people will get plot information, bio information while they're there in the park this coming year. Very skilled use of social media, and they're looking at their first world premiere production next season in February. So there are wonderful examples of companies that have faced very severe financial problems, but they had, however, a unified staff and board determined to rise to the challenge. They involved all their stakeholders, uh, everyone from, again, staff, unions, vendors, and venues, to find a way to make the companies return to stability and actually to set the way for future growth and innovation. So I, I could paint a dire picture. I could bring you stories of why Baltimore Opera or uh, Connecticut Opera closed. But I prefer to focus on the companies that have had success, that have found a way forward using creativity and commitment, good communication, organizational partnership, and stakeholder participation. There, there is a way forward for these companies and for San Diego Opera. So without further ado, why don't you hear from a real general director, not me, someone who has done this so successfully for his opera company, my very, very good colleague and very dear friend, David Devan. Thank you so much. I just, it's awesome to see this many people come to a meeting to care about opera in their community. I'm just so happy I got on the plane to come here and have you start talking yet. Um, you can come back. Oh, good. I will. I will. You know, I came for a number of reasons. Um, you know, in our lives, we all face challenges. Um, in our personal lives, in our opera lives, and when that happens, family shows up. And we have, in this country, one of the best families that a, a sector of arts could ask for. So it's in that spirit that I come today. Um, because this is really hard. It's hard. There's a lot of change. Mark just walked us through just too many variables to write down on one piece of paper. Um, and so we just need to hang together. We need to share. We need to push each other a little bit when appropriate um, to find the right answers. And we need to find our own right answers. So I'm not here today to share with you the Philadelphia plan to sell the Philadelphia plan. I think that I can share the Philadelphia plan to give you some ideas and points of conversation to come up with the San Diego plan. Because your plan is going to be different. And with all the proliferation of media, choices, fragmenting of the audiences, what's happening, which Nick uh, talked about at the beginning, is each community is being able to defer, define opera in its own terms. And that is the path forward. You have to look deep inside with what's important to you and what you care about. I also come from a city that's a little bit south of a major metropolitan center, so I'm from the wrong coast, but I, you know, I have some, a little bit of uh, proximity issues like you all have. Um, and, and you know, we had the mini met issue too. I just I had a donor just introduce me at a, a party on, on Sunday saying, "This is David Devan," and he came and he's changed things at Opera Philadelphia. They were trying to do the mini met on a dollar ninety eight. It wasn't working um, because the just reality is is that there is one that is one model, and it's great. It, and it's great. It's fantastic. I'm a big supporter of that. Um, but Philadelphia is not New York, and San Diego is not LA, and we're not any other city but the ones that we own or that we live in. So I'm going to share with you our plan and some things that we did um, so that you can hopefully have a conversation. Like Mark, I want to talk about challenges first. The first challenge that I've faced since being there is consumer trends with our audience, churn and the waning popularity of subscriptions. And there is good news and bad news in that. The good news is, through some fancy transactional analysis, we have more people seeing opera in Philadelphia than have ever seen opera before. More households are buying tickets than in 40 years of history at opera in our city. Awesome. <laughs> bad news. They're not buying at the same frequency because subscription is a waning model. And in fact, we attract 3,000 new households every year. And the following year, only 300 of them will come back. 
Now, if those people, they'll come back, but someone can come back within five years and still consider themselves to be part of the Opera Philadelphia family. <laughs> so that changes the math of things pretty substantially. It also changed, changes what we offer and, and how we offer. The other thing, the other big challenge that all companies face, and ours is absolutely included in this, is fundraising going beyond today and actually um, adding money for cash reserves and for capital for innovation and even paying for innovation today. We're always on a treadmill to, to, to catch up and we're always looking for that all important change capital. And the third the big challenge that keeps me awake at night is managing the pace of change. And if you're not ready to manage the pace of change, then you just got to go do something else. Um, because, I mean, it's everywhere. I'm competing with Netflix. I got to change. Um, so now the good news to all these challenges is we've got lots of assets. Um, certainly relative to many of our other colleagues and many other arts fields, we've got a lot of toys. Um, We've got a lot of things going on on stage. We have a lot of artists. We have a lot of people making this happen. Everything from stage crews through to the orchestras in the pit. So let's focus on those assets. And I'm going to start at our turnaround. In 2006, I was hired. Um, and we started on a precautionary strategy because we were seeing strains in competition for philanthropic dollars. So we, we set a strategy in place that was going to have a slowly change. But then this little thing called the recession hit in 2008, and our nice little plan turned into a crisis. And so what happened? The board leadership, the executive, the officers of the corporation met in my office at 2 p.m. on Thursday for three months. <laughs> <laughs> because these things, you can't change them overnight. There's a lot of introspection and thought, and you need to understand all these variables. And you're not going to do it at one board meeting. So what we learned through that, or what we determined, that we had to stick with our long-term strategy, but we had to change our tactics. And tactics is something that you can change a lot easier, but you need to have a good strategic line. And then we all had to face the facts and be forever optimistic simultaneously. <laughs> so that's what we did, and we learned some things. We learned that it was too costly to keep on doing what we were doing. In 2004, we did five productions, six performances. By the time I got there, it was, it was four productions. And even that was too costly. That if we were going to survive, we needed to be part of the city, not above it. That our, and following from that, this is important, that our civic footprint was as important as our product footprint. So what I mean is, is that what we do and how we connect in that footprint has to exceed the opera house. And that means we need diversity of operatic experiences, and at the same time, we had to increase overall quality in everything we did, including the big old opera house. So this was a turning point. Everything sort of changed there. Um, in that year, we escrowed the subscription money um, in a brave move. Um, we lauded out the plan explain some change tactics. We were going to go down to three productions in the Academy of Music, the oldest opera house in America, uh, 2,700 seats. And we were going to introduce a chamber series um, in the Perlman Theater, the 550-seat theater. Um, but we could only do that if we raised a million dollars in cash in six weeks, um, which we did, because we had a plan, and it looked different. And we were really committed to it and it was thoughtful because those three months of sitting down with the board, senior board members in my office every Thursday at 2 o'clock paid off. We were living it. We were breathing it. We had all the answers. So we thought everything changes. Um, so um, what that did was started us on a new path. We retired the deficit and we could then start moving forward. And what do we look like now? Our products have changed. We have three product lines. We actually talk about product lines in opera. Imagine. We have Opera at the Academy, which is our large opera house, which does things on grand scale. We have our Aurora series for chamber opera at the Perlman. 
It's 550 seat theater, two operas a year. We also um, have our opera in the city, which is a work that we produce in site-specific places with a community partner every year. So for example, this current season, our, there are seven opera offerings. We have Nabucco, a little grand. We had Ina Damar by Goliath in the large opera house. Amazing, amazing opera, which everyone loved. Uh, you can read about it in opera news. Uh, this month. They loved it too. Um, uh, Don Giovanni, which we are opening uh, next week. But this is in, but this also went in with our Perlman with the Dialogue of Carmelites, which we co-produced with the Curtis Institute of Music, one of the great conservatories in our country. And we're going to open in Gio Coffin in Egypt, a new work specifically written for Frederica von Stada by Ricky Ian Gordon, co-commissioned with HGO in Houston and the Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts in Beverly Hills. In addition, um, on May 8th, we'll be opening a co-production of Salome with the Philadelphia Orchestra. Get this in the concert hall with a theatrical set. So it's a theatrical mashup, co-production with the Philadelphia Orchestra. They're on the stage and we built a set to surround them for this crazy mashup experience. <laughs> and speaking of crazy, um, in November, we launched our Opera in the City initiative and we launched it with a, a, an opera called Zvadba um, Wedding. And it's Serbian, it's a cappella, six women, singing before the night, one of them gets married, straight tone, extended vocal technique, no instrumentation, 50 minutes, um, but then thankfully this great Balkan band uh, came out to the curtain call, moved everybody to another part of the building, and we had a complete wedding cake, beer kegs, and uh, a dance floor, and everyone stayed and got drunk. <laughs> Fifty percent. It was sold. The run was sold out. Um, it, oh, and it was at um, an old pump station um, below the Ben Franklin Bridge that we co-produced with the Fringe Arts. Fifty percent of the people were new to file, had never been to anything we'd ever done. It was like the hipsters meet the Tierra crowd all together. <laughs> Also this year, we have three composers in residence. This is the program that uh, was written, uh, that Nick talked about, um, funded by Andrew Mellon. Uh, Levin Beecher, Christine Mazzoli, and Andrew Norman, each are in three-year residencies, um, developing their opera craft and communicating with our community. And um, we're getting to see the inside of what it's like to write an opera. Um, so that, we went from four operas to seven happenings and three um, composers in residence um, in the course of about four years. And our annual budget is $10.5 million. Think about it. <laughs> I'm going to tell you in a bit how we do it. It's, it's, um, there's a little secret sauce there. Um, the other thing we've been involved in is elect electronic media. So our broadcast on Independence Mall is free. Um, and like the situation in Dallas, it's bringing a whole new demographic. Um, and we've just done all this uh, branding research, and our community work, according to the researchers, um, is actually um, the greatest source of our brand equity. And brand equity is what the stickiness is in your brand that allow your consumers to really highly value it. So the community work, the free performances that we do there, our random acts of culture that we did in Macy's and at Reading Terminal, 13 million YouTube views later of iconic Philadelphia places, those things actually add more value to your brand equity because they have broader reach than what you do in, in the opera house. Amazing. Um, annual contributed income has increased 85% from 4 million to 7.8 million since 2006. Um, this is because we've had a number of, and we ought to get seven, several seven figure national grants um, for much of the new work we are doing. And we've also built a solid um, base of operation of new gifts above 25,000 from local individuals, all the way from 25,000 to a million dollars. Our largest annual gift is a million dollars a year. Um, our average ticket yield has increased 24%. So we too have seen the same sort of erosion in terms of the volume, but we've, our, our income has remained flat because we've been able to make up for that in um, yield. Another amazing statistic, we just got this data in uh, last month, our, our largest single ticket buying uh, demographic, 27% of our single ticket buyers are 25 to 34. Amazing. <laughs> It's amazing. 
much you wish for me. They ain't gonna subscribe. <laughs> Gotta find another way to keep them involved. So what are the underpinnings of this work? First of all, you have to embody the spirit of the city, we believe, in everything you do. You have to have a love affair. It's a place that you live in. Two, partnerships, 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 partnerships. Three, consumer choice. Embrace it. Don't fight it. And third, venture philanthropy. Think like someone looking for venture capital and find the donors that think the same way. So embody the spirit of our city. I believe it's our responsibility to earn the love and the trust of our city that we live in and that it has our, the character of the city has to live in everything we do. And we do that by busting out of the opera house a lot. Philadelphia is the birthplace of our nation. It's the place of first, first everything. Um, and it's a city of brotherly love. So everything we need to do needs to be innovative. It has to have that American innovative edge. It has to propel our genre forward. It has to embody the American ideals of progress. We need to have a character with a streak of independence, because that's Philly, and love of our city. And we actually talk about that at artistic planning meetings. Was what we are producing, does it have that vibe? Does it have that feel? So as you guys start your conversation, what's San Diego's soul? What does it mean about living here? Spend some time really chewing on that, and you'll come up with your own answers. And it'll be authentic, and it'll be real, and people will care. You just need to figure out what that is you're going to untap. Partnerships. Um, we, everything we do is in partnership. Um, we have eight new works in development in addition to the three that Nick talked about, every one with a co-commissioner. We have the Curse Institute of Music. We're truly blessed by having them. Um, we've co-produced Botset, Cunning Little Vixen, uh, Auntie and Cleopatra, and Dialogue of the Carmelites with them. Um, we've got the Composer in Residence program, which we partner with people in the big city up the highway, um, uh, Gotham Chamber Opera, and Music Theater Group uh, from New York great ways to bring the cities together and we just did joint work where we produced something in Philadelphia and then we did it at the Opera Center in, in, in New York. Uh, the Barnes Foundation, we have a recital and lecture series there, it's a pretty important place. Fringe Arts is bringing in all that hipster crowd um, and uh, with our opera in the city and we also do our composer in residence uh, performances there. The Philadelphia Orchestra producing in a concert hall. Um, this is what makes our output really, our output is what a 50 million dollar company is? for 10 million, because you're using the assets of other institutions um, to fulfill our mission while we fulfill their mission at the same time, and finding that win-win. And the trick to partnerships, I think, is you just kind of got to leave your ego at the door, because you need to actually embrace what everyone else does. Consumer choice. You can't force your customers to do what you want them to do. <laughs> the days of buying these five operas that include the three that you really want to see are over. It's true. They get to pick. So progress needs to be elective. So what we've done with our product lines is think about different types of opera presentations. And we separated them out so no one has to take anything they don't want. Mm -hmm. Everything we do at the Perlman is very contemporary. We've done Henza's Phaedra, I mean, all, all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, and it's elective. You don't have to come to it if you don't want to. Um, and I think the idea that one size fits all is a danger. And that's why I think different venues, different experiences, and decoupling what you do is so important. Because it's the cons it puts the consumer in charge. Um, new markets and new customers are good, but they're probably not going to look like how you look, and they're not going to want what you want necessarily, and that's okay. It's a multi-channel universe. Our offer companies have to be multi-channel offerings. They have to live like that and behave like that, because that's the world we live in. And finally, venture philanthropy. I love this term. It's our chairman's term, um, Dr. Dan Meyer, who um, considers himself a venture philanthropist. So, and I love that because I need philanthropy. Um, so, most organizations are undercapitalized. So that means that we don't have enough liquidity, right, to fuel what we do, and we certainly don't have enough money to fuel innovation because we don't actually have um, strong current positions on our balance sheet. 
So what we've come to do is start thinking a bit like a venture capital model. So if I was a startup, and if I needed venture capital, how would I describe that? What would be the returns on investment? And that's what I'm asking people to commit to, not to the status quo or helping me turn on the electrical bill or pay the electrical bill. I want people that I want I need to find new money to invest in new ideas. And that will keep the status quo in play as well as moving forward. So progress looks like being able to talk about it and then seeking philanthropy that is looking for a return on investment in terms of a community good for that. So, you know, the Composer in Residence program got a $1.4 million grant from the Andrew Mellon Foundation. It was their first grant with us. But it was because we proposed a program that didn't look like any other program that was happening that had real returns on the ecology of our field. I think the only other thing I didn't have in my notes, but I want to talk about, I was standing out there and we were talking outside and the stagehands and I were um, hanging out there. And I want to talk, and I want to talk about labor. Because <laughs> we're all in this together. <laughs> we, we have um, IATSE, AF of M, and AGMA, we work with them. And What's been amazing about this is we've all worked together for all these changes because we came to the party and said we want to preserve employment, we don't want to hurt it, and we were able to have a real live conversation. And everybody that's on the deck, every stage hand, they're here. They care. The musicians care, the singers care. And that this can't be a conversation that happens with just the audience and just the board. It's all going to be something that happens together. here in San Diego and we feel confident that one way or another you'll plot a course forward and I'll be looking forward to coming back and seeing you in your, your new version 2.0. <laughs> well I'm torn because um, you both said such wonderful things, uh, and you've given us so much to hope for, which is what I had hoped would happen at this town hall meeting. Um, just seeing, and, and I know this this room seats 420 people, seeing all of you packed in here, and I know there are people outside uh, who are watching on monitors, it, it, it shows the intense interest and support that there is in this community for our wonderful art form. Uh, and I hope in the comments that you heard uh, this afternoon from these two wonderful gentlemen uh, that you've been able to gain a sense of um, forward thinking, a, a sense of optimism about where we are and what we can be and what we can do. A lot of these ideas are not new to us. A lot of these ideas are ideas that, that actually have passed around our tables uh, on the 18th floor. But obviously things need to change, and they need to change quickly for us to take advantage of the community support that we have here. Um, I was going to have 10 minutes just to have the three of us have a little bit of an open discussion in front of you all. Unfortunately, they went way too long. <laughs> uh, but it's awkward. Right. It's always <laughs> long. <laughs> I'm delighted that they did it, and so Mark and David, I want to thank you for your generosity and for the generosity of your companies, Opera America and Opera Philadelphia, for sparing you for a few hours to come to San Diego and share your knowledge. Um, so thank you very much from the bottom of my heart, and I know from the spirit of all the people that are gathered here at the San Diego. <laughs>
Good, you're not leaving because you know we've got more. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, we're open for questions from the audience for the next 30 minutes, both here in the room as well as remotely on Google Hangouts. Um, I would appreciate it, however, let's just a few rules before you, the hands go up. Um, I would appreciate it if you keep your questions to the topic at hand, and the topic has been alternative models of the business plan for San Diego Opera, and even alternative programming. We can dream, can't we? So let's dream together. But please, keep your questions brief, because I'm, I'm only going to let us do this for a half hour. I, we, we've all got to go home. Some of us have religious services to get to, and I, know, I, and I, I don't want to keep you too long. These guys have to catch a plane. Um, we opera lovers, by the way, are great storytellers, and we love to share our stories. <laughs> But this is really not the time for that. <laughs> so I'd ask you to edit yourselves as much as you can before you ask your question. There will be two roamers with um, uh, microphones so that, you're, so that you can be heard clearly and we'd like you to stand up. By the way, also, this is not an opportunity for venting or personality bashing. So please, let's try to be really strict with ourselves and keep things polite and on topic. So let's have some questions. Quickly, thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Robert Bird. You don't care about that. I've been a resident of the city of San Diego for 22 years. You don't care about that. What do you care about is the question. Is that 20 years ago, 20 years ago, I was given the opportunity and the privilege to work for the San Diego Opera Scenic Studio under the tutelage of John David Peters. Yeah. You may know that name. He's dedicated 35 years of his life to the end of, to the institution. <laughs> so the question is, how much do you value the arts? You've all heard about the 400 people whose uh, um, daily livelihood is at jeopardy because of the closure of the institution. What you haven't heard about is me. I'm the tangential fallout of the San Diego Opera. 20 years ago, I worked for them. Today, I work for the county of San Diego. If you've received a criminal subpoena in the last 12 years, I, I created it. So the question is, how much do you care about the arts? You're already here. I'm preaching to the choir. Yes, you are. And, but but you're, off, you're off topic. You really are. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're off topic, please. Yeah, back here, Anne Louise, please, quickly. Yeah. Yes. What legal options have been discovered thus far that can be done with the current endowment going forward to innovations, including the Geisel endowment? And I don't want to see La Boheme again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I can't really answer for what is, I think, a, a question that's appropriate more to a board member than it is to me. But the fact is, I do know that there are an awful lot of legal, um, what do you call them? Um, um, actions, I suppose, or, or, or suggested actions or um, that, that, that are going forward. I mean, well, look. The bottom line is, we are doing everything we can to keep this company open against, I think, people who really sincerely believe that it needs to close. And, and, and we're doing absolutely everything we can. And one, one further response there is, even though you don't want to see La Boheme again, the company may need to do La Boheme again. There's so many people who want to see it. But, but I, think, I think the answer I think the answer is, is in what both gentlemen had to say about diversifying our product. I think that's critical. Yeah. Yes, right here. Opera 2.0. One of the biggest concerns, I guess, as a subscriber in the past has been we have used Groupon. We have used those resources. But that almost devalues the people who paid originally the larger amounts. So how can we reverse that? so that the subscribers and bring new people into it. That way we can have our Opera 2.0 without hurting people saying, well, I'd rather wait to the last minute and get a discount coupon versus spending my money 
up front. Um, I know that I'm very, I don't like discounts generally, um, and I think what we found is um, the reason why people have to discount is because they're oversupplying the market. Um, so that there's not enough demand, and so you have to move stuff. Um, and so I think you need to first calibrate supply and demand as best you can for full for full value. And then if you do, in our experience, by doing that, it allowed us to um, develop other products that those people that were buying discounts want valued higher and therefore pay more money. So I think there's there's a blend through that, but it has to do with largely um, dealing with supply and demand uh, calibration. I totally agree that uh, you can devalue um, you can devalue the the product. And uh, we're just did some uh, research, and discounts are becoming more and more less or sorry more and more or less. Can you believe I just said that? Uh, <laughs> why they are becoming yeah they're they're becoming less important um, at day by day. Uh, so, but because I think the value of a product, I mean, you know, a 25 year old is going to pay 175 dollars to sit in a crappy seat for Lady Gaga because they want to go. Um, we just need to produce something that they want to go to. And Louise, for that, I'd like to ask two questions. The first is, in your experience for our visitors, with your smaller up companies with somewhat reduced programs, is the percentage of ticket revenue of total budget? About the same, around 30%, which means there's still a very great need for philanthropy. Yeah. And the second question is, what do you have in your op companies or the op companies around the country uh, for what here we call the educational program that is one with essentially, as I understand it, no revenue but extreme importance? Um, a couple of, couple of points there. Um, I asked the general director of Boston Lyric Opera that very same question. And when they do their opera annex, and they are in a smaller venue, lower ticket prices, fewer performances, fewer people, don't they have to raise just as much money as if they were doing another main stage opera production? And the answer was yes. They do have to raise just as much money, but that the fundraising narrative is so different that they can't raise more money to do more of the same thing. But the new narrative about a new approach to opera has enlivened their entire fundraising program. So the dollars aren't diminished, but the energy is greatly increased. In terms of education, yes, most of these programs are absolutely free, but they're all to the schools and students, there's a minimal charge. Uh, but there certainly are philanthropies that will support education who won't support what you're doing on your main stage or second stage or third stage. So one has to be strategic in finding the funders who believe in the value of arts education, and there are plenty of them. I wanted to go back to one other statement that was just made earlier uh, about subscriber recruitment. I think a lot of us have become accustomed to highly professionalized situations where the marketing staff designs the brochures and direct mail and the telemarketing campaign and the social media campaign. I wish that every subscriber, every ticket buyer felt an equal ownership in the success of the company so that you are talking to your friends and family and neighbors and co-workers about coming to the opera. You can each be a personal shopper for others who are curious about opera and you can get them to attend with you. It's not just the staff on 18 who are responsible for it. Let's share the responsibility for building the opera audience. Ken, did you have a, a question? Let, let's get it on mic, though, please. I think there was. Okay. Oh, I'm, I, well. I had a question, if I may. Stand up. Um, I have actually a quick, a two part question. One is how did you quickly determine what it is that your community wants in terms of having a broadly based? program. Obviously we can't produce the same thing for everybody all across the city and have it be successful. We're a very multicultural city. It seems like part of our success is going to be based on building upon that fact. That's one question. So how do you tap into what people want, find out what it is? The other question is how would you broaden the viewpoint of your board so that they embrace the need for change and they were willing to support your change and willing to take chances. Great. So, uh, the answer to question one is, because uh, I was new to Philadelphia, I was actually new to the US or Canada, so I didn't know what the vibe of the community was at all. So what I did was I looked and saw where everyone was being successful. 
and where people were being successful, not in the mainstream, but on the on the fringes. Um, so, um, what theater companies were doing the most interesting work? Um, who who is really having a success, but not on a mainstream success? And then approach them to partner, and then you find out. Um, so I think there's a lot of great intelligence by just um, looking around and see who's doing what and who's actually successful, who's open, who seems to have a relationship with the community, and then figure out a way to partner with them. And then it, it kind of seeps into the DNA of your company, which is actually gets to the second part of the question. Um, uh, with um, how do you have the board uh, talk? And I remember we did a benchmarking study. My friend here, Mark Sparka, and they calculated what our individual contributions were per attender. Um, and uh, ours at the time, it was, it was um, I have no idea, I have the number you. $23.95. And the next closest companies were like Minnesota was like 70 and Pittsburgh was like 41 and Dallas was, I don't know, like 100 or something. So, um, that was like a really cold part of like, well, what does that ratio really indicate? What that ratio indicates is do people care about you? Um, so uh, that became that having that analytic was the breaking point for everyone to get behind change because all you had to do is like every time you went kind of off and stopped talking about change. You just have to go back and pull up the number again. So I think if you want to instigate change, you need to find the right quantitative measure to actually keep you honest about it and just get it out on the table. And that's what I talked about facing the fact. And I think that's better, faster, more effective than having a philosophical conversation. Because it's just it's the fact. You just deal. Or if there's one way at the back. Yeah, there's, a, there's a, been a lot of talk about uh, new media finding new avenues of, of media to show the operas through. Uh, is there any plans to, say, team up with KBBS or maybe UCST to broadcast those plays, those operas? No plan that I'm aware of at the moment. I mean, we, we talked about um, doing simulcasts and, and uh, you know, the stadium kind of thing, or actually even, even doing a simulcast out on the plaza uh, during uh, a performance. We've always been told that it was prohibitively expensive, and that would be one of my questions for, for you, David. How, how it costs expensive us a, is it? It costs us a quarter million dollars. We um, put an enormous backlit screen right beside the Liberty Bell um, LED screen. We put a $90,000 surround sound, sound system around Independence Mall. It's first rate. Um, but it was paid for completely with new money the first three years. Um, and then now it's just rolled into operating. And, and I think it is you know, a narrow analysis to say how much does that transmission to independent small cost. Because really it's how much does it cost to completely change the narrative about the opera company. Mm -hmm. And a quarter million dollars may be a lot to spend to do one night on independent small, right. but it's not a lot of money to spend to change the narrative about the opera company. And I would just point out that at San Francisco Opera, while it is in no way, um, you know, completely floating the boat of the institution, still they've sold about $2 million in tickets to people they've discovered through their transmissions to the baseball park. Um, one of the things we have to do is take a much longer look at the returns on some of our investment. And board members need to be encouraged to look at some short-term measures and some longer-term measures, because sometimes good change is worth waiting for. And, that, and that's how what changed with our boards mind and they've been like the best they're like the best because they take the long-term view every time Ken. yeah yeah this is a question about um, the administrative expense um, uh, there seems to be some concern here in San Diego that that is an over an overburdening part of the budget what what do companies that are at a turnaround place um, is there some kind of metric that they um, well, I can't think of no other verb than slash, but uh, reduce the um, uh, uh, amount of percentage of budget that is for administration. There, there's no metric per se, but Opera America does do a lot of comparative analysis for our opera companies so that we can show how much money is spent on the core artistic product, how much is spent on educational programs, how much is spent on general administrative expenses. So we do do analyses for companies. And there are ranges, and depends on the level 
But a lot of that is also locally, uh, you know, we do national analysis, but a lot of it is locally determined as well, given cost of living and other uh, salaries and administrative expenses that are in the locality. So th those are answers we have and metrics we can produce for a company. I don't have a simple answer because it's a fairly complicated analysis. In the back. Do these new ideas involve, to what extent do they involve giving up on some of the traditional artistic values, specifically starting to amplify voices in the standard repertoire? We don't amplify voices um, in the standard repertoire. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, in our turnaround, um, we actually spend more money on our standard rep than we did in 2006. So each opera we do, we spend probably about a half to six, a half a million to six hundred thousand dollars more per production on talent, values, everything in. Um, but we do less of it, um, and we make each one count. Um, the only time that we had, uh, there's twice we've had microphone voices and it was for Ina Damar because it's written that way, um, but not for the standard the standard rep. So I think it, I mean, you know, Mark and I have talked about creative, the sort of theory of creative destruction, which is an economic theory that, you know, says things need to die in order for new things to emerge in an economy. And so I think if you thought about an opera company as a closed economy, you know, are there creative acts of destruction that you can do? So it might mean that you have to stop doing something that's been traditional to fortify the traditional part of the business and to breathe new life into doing something new. So and no cotton quality, I think cotton quality is like the, the total wrong way to go. I agree completely with David that much of it can be um, facilitated through the reallocation of resources, that you have a set uh, budget that your company can support and you allocate those resources differently than you used to in terms of different kinds of products and different venues for different people. Quality though uh, must be a compelling factor of any opera company in anything it does. So at every level. At every level. Whether it's an education program or a, the equipment used in a transmission to independent small, that, that quality, high quality must be the defining characteristic in order to strengthen your brand and to compel people to contribute, to renew, to come again, to tell their friends about it. So no diminution in quality. It may be a diminution in quantity so that you are reallocating resources in a, in a more strategic way. And so just one other thing on, on quality and the cost of quality too. Uh, in my work, I find that um, you can produce quality um, at a reasonable investment rate if you're doing um, projects or operas that people want to be involved in. So for example, our Don Carlo that we're doing next year, it has like a, the rock, a rock star cast, mm -hmm. but they're all doing it for the first time. Eric Owens is doing his first King Philip, I mean, Leah Crocetto, Dimitri Pitas. And so I think what we do when we start looking at programming isn't that I, David Devan, the general director, want to produce Eugene O'Negan. What we do is we start and look up and start talking to singers about what are the things the best singers, what do they want to do? And you know what? They're going to cut you some slack to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so. Hey, my name is Dr. Anderson, and I am a music teacher at Enrique Middle School in Escondido. Fantastic. And I'm here because I'm on spring break. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I want San Diego Opera to be the number one. Uh, highest artistic um, organization in town. But what I see is this big problem between cities in San Diego. I see this idea that things that happen in San Diego, the city of San Diego, don't happen in North County and, and aspects like that. One of the problems is the San Diego Center for the, the, the um, Escondido Center for the Arts is closing. What would have been really nice had there been, yes, it's closing. What really would have been nice is if um, San Diego Opera floated throughout the county in, uh, in various ways to then be able to service more people in the entire San Diego and, 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 and more importantly bring, see we have, to, we have to take our cue from religion. We have to take our cue, we have to indoctrinate the youth. And in order to, that's true, we have to indoctrinate our youth. And when we indoctrinate the youth, 
they come. Yeah. <laughs> so my, my, my question is why hasn't, hasn't San Diego Opera done more to facilitate uh, and have a meeting with other mayors and other places? So no, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I think that in many ways the company has been a little stingy about partnerships. Um, I, I, I don't want to point at our education program because our education program tries to be broad in terms of its approach throughout the county. And in fact, I've got the numbers to prove that we have indeed done that. But it hasn't been significant. It hasn't been enough. Um, uh, I, I, I hope that it's not true that that performing arts or is it there, um, um, theater is, is closing. Um, because it's a, it's a jewel. There are two jewel theaters there that if we diversified our product, if there was something that we, we could specifically do for Escondido, and as a North County boy myself, practically born and certainly raised in Oceanside, I know that we need that up there. So, you know, my heart is with you. It's just, you know, starting down this road of diversification, which I think is extremely important and really critical for us right now. But duly noted for San Diego Opera 2.0. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a question remotely from the Google Hangout. Okay, I can focus on doing this. Okay. This is a question from our uh, live stream. And it is, a common conception is that contemporary music slant art is hard to digest. Do ticket sales suggest that? And uh, so San Diego is an innovative culture. Our audience is hungry for more innovative programming. There is no monolithic opera audience. <laughs> um, so there is an audience for Bohem, and there is an audience for Hans Werner Hensen's Phaedra, as David discovered in Philadelphia. And I, I think we have to get over the thinking that all of our audience uh, opera lovers are going to come to all the things we do. Some people will come to some things. Some people will not go to those. People will like some and dislike others. Uh, but it's OK to have different audiences for different things that you do. Mm -hmm. uh, our research indicates that it is the seasoned opera lover who enjoys the new and different because they have seen the core repertoire enough. Uh, and yet, if the work is by Philip Glass or some others, uh, John Adams, then younger people also come because they have a following. There's, there's no rule. The art of programming is an art. And you have to be prepared for different audiences to like different things. And there's no one contemporary music, mm -hmm. right? There's a very, you know, Steve or uh, Kevin put Silent Night, mm -hmm. um, you know, had a huge success um, with all of our various audiences. Mm -hmm. Well, so, and I think you guys probably agree too that the composers are writing for audiences again. Some composers. <laughs> <laughs> well, and they'll choose to do those. Uh, they're all pretty <laughs> <high>. It's just <laughs> different audiences. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, and Louise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, my question relates to marketing. Uh, I was pleased this year to see San Diego Opera uh, advertising on, on KPBS. I think we're missing, however, one of the major purveyors of classical music and opera in, in Southern California. And we're missing, because we're missing them, we're missing, we're not targeting the LA audience as well. And that purveyor is KUSC, where you have four major supporters with Duff Murphy and uh, Jim Schweda. Uh, and the other the other people up there. What can we do to get on their radar so that they are promoting us to the LA audience? I believe we do that. Um, maybe not as much as you would wish us to, and, and perhaps not as much as I think. But I, I know that we have made outreach to KUSC, and we have had ads on LA stations as well as LA print media. Um, just it takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of money. Yeah. Um, yeah, whoever has a mic because yeah. otherwise you're not going to be here. For here. And oh by the way, you've got five minutes. So make your questions brief and quick. This will be a 10 second question. Um, my name's Dr. Dick Brighty. First question is if the board decides tonight to terminate the San Diego Opera how much money do we have to raise and how fast do we have to raise it to start a new structure? That's a really good question. And I, I, 
I do know the number is not $10 million. That's, I don't know where that came from, and it's simply fiction. Uh, but I've heard anywhere from 4.3 to 6.4 million. I, I, I'm really not sure. I, I can't speak to that. The pundit says any road will get you there if you don't know where you're going. <laughs> any budget is needed if you don't know where you're going. So um, the answer to that would be, well, it depends on what it is you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 well, and, and the answer to that, too, also depends on um, whether the board decides to continue with the 2015 season. Now, I know the plan is being put before them today with significant cuts that will still allow us to do a 2015 season rather much intact. Uh, but with significant changes that, that would not be horribly missed by the audience. Uh, and the remember that, yes, if the, if, the, if the board does indeed vote to do that, uh, which they haven't yet, um, uh, we've got two more weeks to pull it out. Um, for this, this side, yeah, and yeah. My name is Vincent Martin. I'm a member of the Opera Chorus, and I want to thank you all here for coming and supporting our craft. I have never seen this kind of unity and walls breaking down between groups to come together for a common goal. Uh, I've heard a lot about programming and venues, but I'd like to ask about casting. Uh, the current trend is to seek the best voices, the most expensive ones around the world, and yet we have a wealth of talent right here in Southern California. I'd like to have a conversation with Mr. Campbell about 20 years ago and suggest that one of the five performances could be cast with local singers, members of the opera chorus. And the response was, well, we have our opera artists ensemble. And that's all great, but we're talking about principal roles rather than just Colt Mario. Do you have any experience with that kind of a risk? Uh, well, we're sort of blessed in Philadelphia because we have the Curtis Institute of Music and the Academy of Vocal Arts um, and a number of other vocal schools. So we have a, a big, rich tradition of, of uh, young singers. Um, but in other markets I've worked in, too, I've always made it a point to build a relationship with the local artists. Um, and you need to do that over time. And as a result, you will see people cast in our shows um, that aren't only international. So the cast I just rattled off for Don Carlo looks very different than the cast uh, for Barber of Seville, uh, which has a young, energetic cast um, and a number of uh, a local a number of local singers in in some roles. So I think it's really uh, back to what I said earlier: partnership, partnership, partnership. And you know, if there are if, if, if there's a group of local artists and they're being trained here, or if they uh, live in the community, figuring out a way to partner with them. Um, we use a lot of local singers for our composers' workshops. We do write a lot of new music in our shop right now. We have a huge contemporary opera practice. And using local singers for that has been a, a, a godsend, and, we, and it's a paying gig. So, you know, all that helps the ecology. Uh, question here, and we've got time for this one, and probably just one more. Uh, thank you. My name is Jack Rubin. I, I have the privilege of heading up a nonprofit technology company that actually powers the San Diego Opera and the Opera Philadelphia and Dallas Opera, <laughs> San Diego Symphony, the Old Globe Theater, the Metropolitan Opera, and 450 around the world. So I've got a little, little bit of insight into the way that uh, arts and cultural organizations operate and seeing uh, the way that uh, partnerships have been talked about, see the way that breaking down walls has been talked about. One business model that changed that hasn't been talked about, we have so many other good artistic companies in San Diego that uh, there could be some business uh, consolidation. Keep the art form pure, but involve a back office work that uh, can have one system, one accounting department, joint purchasing, joint things. This has happened in many other cities in, in Pittsburgh, and they're, they're, not, other, they're not merged in Pittsburgh. They're not merged. I'm not saying there could be a merger or there could be a consolidation of services. Uh, that's both. That's happening in the United States and around the world. So when we talk about saving an art form, we can talk about saving an art form, but we can also talk about change in terms of business model change. And if we're not open to that, that's a challenge. So I, I guess the question is, is that on the table for that to be considered? Uh, and I, I just haven't read about that or heard about it. It's an interesting proposal. I mean, it's certainly worth considering. I think every organization, though, would have to decide whether it's worth 
their money and their time and, and, and whether the, the return on investment would be would be worth it. Okay. To the to the two gentlemen that are visiting, uh, my question revolves around the current uh, situation that the opera here is facing, okay. which is basically they're talking about liquidating capital asset, and I'm wondering how are we going to uh, are any other companies around the country that have renewed themselves dealt with a liquidation of capital asset and had uh, some sort of a survival rate, and if so, what did they do? The companies that have been on the ropes have not had a lot of asset to liquidate, and what they've had, they haven't liquidated. I told you about uh, Austin Lyric Opera, which did sell its building. They built a uh, an office rehearsal facility that was also the home to a community music school, so it was used seven days a week all the time. And they wound up selling that building, so there was a liquidation that helped to uh, paid off their debt, and they're now just renting office and rehearsal space. Um, in terms of sets and costumes and other kinds of stock like that, or shops that you have here, you know, these other companies have not sold off any assets. They've preserved their um, institutional integrity while trying to turn around the organization. Uh, I think that I can say on behalf of the White Knight Committee and the the staff and board members who are struggling to save San Diego Opera, that we're so aware of that possibility um, that I, I just don't think it's going to go very far. I, and, and that is my fervent hope that we don't get rid of our assets, because if, if they do sell off the assets, there's no way of coming back. Um, you know, it's, it would be almost impossible for a new organization to start from scratch, and that's a really important thing for all of you to know. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think we need to end this. I just don't want to keep you past 90 minutes, and we're there now. I do want to thank all of you very, very much, first of all, for your, your kind-hearted support. I, I tell you, at the performances of Don Quixote, Every, the thing that kept coming to my mind was that I had never seen a sad audience, ever, in my life. And yet, at the end of that show, at the end of every performance, it was the most supportive, glorious, happy audience that I have ever experienced. The, the, the highs and lows emotionally for all of us on staff, and those of you union members, employees, anyone connected to San Diego Opera, it's just been really, really tough. Don't let this moment go by without our doing something positive to make this company stay open. SaveSanDiegoOpera.org is where you'll be updated. Thank you again for being here. Sorry, earlier. Oh, <laughs>